welcome to the Acid Trash Jamboree and to the beginning of another mini-series, uh, which I'll be returning to intermittently, uh, this time shining a spotlight on assorted acid or psychedelic folk releases that I've got squirreled away in the collection. Now, I've been into this kind of music, as well as all of its uh, variants and offshoots, uh, for over two decades now, so yeah, needless to say, uh, this could run for a good while. Uh, this particular video concentrates on albums released on private or micro-press labels uh, during the early to mid-70s. So we start with Am I Really Here All Alone by Philip John Lewin, uh, which was first released in 1975 on uh, his own Gargoyle Records imprint, in a limited edition of uh, 300 copies, uh, then it was reissued on CD by the South Korean label Big Pink Music in 2011. So this charming homespun album uh, presents us with a selection of loner tunes, uh, ranging from the poignant, melancholic likes of Opener, Unusual Day and the minor classic Watercolours, uh, which featured prominently in the 2018 Jamie Bell film Skin, uh, to more rock and roll and blues-inflected tracks like King of Queens and Sweet George has Got to Be Home Tonight. Uh, whilst the piano ballad, Touch, is a bit more dramatic than the rest of the cuts and almost resembles uh, Robbie Basho's florid ivory tinkling in places. At various points on the album, uh, Lewin's guitar and vocals are fed through a slapback echo effect, uh, which lends a gentle trippiness to proceedings and blends well with the crusty, low-fidelity atmosphere of the recording. The closing title tune is uh, perhaps the album's moodiest and most psychedelic moment with expansive minor and major seventh acoustic chords floating around Lewin's weary, resigned sounding voice. Uh, bringing to mind the self-titled Dino Valente album, uh, which is a real personal favourite. Now, I've read some criticism uh, regarding the near-constant lead guitar noodling that features on pretty much every track here, saying that it distracts from the songs. Admittedly, Lewin might have been wise to exclude it from a few of the tunes uh, for variety's sake, but overall it's not too overbearing and it doesn't clutter up the mix, uh, to my ears at least. Yeah, as I say, Am I Really Here All Alone is mostly very low-key and is only mildly spaced out, so it's unlikely to blow your mind, but if you're after something laid back to spin on a sad, reflective evening, then this should suit the occasion nicely. Okay, so Lewin made uh, one more album in the 70s, Diamond Love and Other Realities, uh, which I haven't heard yet, but apparently it's much uh, jazzier than his debut. Uh, then in more recent times, uh, he's put out a clutch of stuff, actually, with his most recent album being 2020's Real Classic. Okay, on to The Crying of a Generation by Bill Clint. Uh, another mid-70s uh, private press of folk obscurity reissued on CD by the Big Pink label. Now, how to describe this one? I've seen it compared to everybody from uh, Bob Trimble and Nick Drake to Tim Buckley... Yeah, well, I'm not sure about the first two, but uh, there's definitely more than a hint of the early Buckley sound in Clint's chiming 12-string guitar work and his trembling, emotive voice. Uh, though as far as I'm aware, not even Tim got so into his music that he started audibly weeping during a performance. Yeah, this is that album, uh, containing not one, but two genuine crying fits, uh, but more on those in a second. So yeah, the crying of a generation uh, gets underway with Faces, We've Run Out of Time, a stirringly dramatic ballad uh, replete with string orchestration, uh, on which Clint duets with an unnamed female. Now this is more in the Lee Hazelwood or Richard Harris mould than anything suggested by those earlier comparison points. Uh, no bad thing in my books, but yeah, those expecting wall-to-wall uh, -wall lysergic madness from this LP uh, may want to look elsewhere or at least hang on for another few songs. Next, uh, Just To Love Each Other is a fairly nondescript acoustic guitar and vocal piece uh, with simple chord changes that you've heard a million times before and is unfortunately the uh, sort of thing that clogs up a lot of these vanity press efforts from this era. Thankfully then, uh, Christmas in July is a, a bit more interesting. 
Again, compositionally, it's uh, nothing you haven't heard before, relying on chord changes taken straight out of the Blonde on Blonde songbook. Although the echo-drenched uh, organ work adds a spectral, almost ecclesiastical atmosphere to the song, which uh, definitely lifts it out of the stock folk rock quagmire. And speaking of holy things, uh, next is the record centerpiece, the 11-minute Angels Don't Need Friends, which became its most infamous cut due to Clint's aforementioned crying fit that occurs about seven minutes into the performance. Yeah, whilst Clint's sobs and boo-hoos were undoubtedly meant in earnest, uh, they do start to sound a, a bit silly after a couple of plays, as well as detracting from the rest of the song, which is otherwise rather lovely and understated. Uh, again, bringing to mind the wonderful Dino Valenti album. But yeah, definitely an odd, somewhat uncomfortable moment on what up until now has been a perfectly pleasant listen. Clint's songs get more and more intense and angst-riddled from here on in with the frenzied strumming of Babe Is It Easy, almost bringing to mind the uh, proto-apocalyptic stylings of Fire of Life by Changes. The song segues into Mama I'm a Baby, which, suitably enough, kicks off with Clint bawling loudly like a newborn infant. Yeah, Angels Don't Need Friends gets all the attention, but for me, uh, this is definitely the album's strangest and most jarring moment. The song itself is rather creepy and low-key, with Clint lyrically regressing to childhood and what sounds like a celeste or bell piano chiming away around his uh, descending chord pattern, uh, giving things quite a sinister feeling. After a brief reprise of... Babe Is It Easy, the song Stephen uh, continues the lyrical theme of childhood pain and angst, but musically at least closes the record on a more easygoing note. This one brings to mind the classic tune Everybody's Talking, made famous of course by Harry Nielsen, but actually written by Fred Neal. So yeah, to attempt to put it into some kind of context, uh, whilst it certainly has its moments, the crying of a generation isn't quite up there with freaky classics like, say, uh, Midge's Yodeling Astrologer or any of Ed Askew's stuff. Overall, this is probably of most interest to avid listeners of aforementioned 12-string troubadours like Neil Buckley and Valenti more than anybody else. Yeah, from what I can gather, Bill Clint only released one other album entitled America, Lady of Liberty in 2010 before sadly passing away at the end of 2015. Lastly for now, we have the second album by Clearing uh, from Boston in the USA. This trio of Sarah Benson, Jeff Brewer and Joan Minkoff formed in 1971 initially to record a collection of hymns for the religious group that they were members of, the UUA, which came out as the LP Who Is In My Temple in 1972. In 1973, however, Clearing wanted to make an album mostly comprising of original tunes and featuring contributions from assorted friends and family members. This self-titled effort was the end result. Again, those expecting uh, instant acidic thrills may be turned off a little bit by the opening cover of Morning Has Broken, which is obviously heavily informed by the Cat Stevens version, but is somehow uh, even wispier and lighter than his take. Things do quickly uh, become more inspired, though, with Morning Light, which is a loose, pastoral, bluesy number in the style of Bert Yanch and Pentangle whilst uh, Sarah Benson's Sunshine Man is a curious, kind of sparse piece, uh, equal parts inspired by raga, jazz and pop music. Benson also uh, penned the next tune, the poignant She's Leaving. Yeah, with gorgeous piano accompaniment from Joan Minkoff. Uh, this could easily be mistaken for a long-lost outtake by Joni Mitchell circa Ladies of the Canyon or Blue. After this uh, deeply melancholic and sombre interlude, uh, the next cuts take the album in a more rootsy direction, uh, with Minkoff turning in a couple of bittersweet ragtime numbers, whilst uh, Jeff Brewer's novelty hoedowns, The Church Where We Got Married, and Seth are unfortunately uh, fairly horrible and skippable. 
Thank goodness then for Jeff's brother Leeds, who steers things back down a more psych folkish path with his composition When I Was a Young Boy. Yeah, this one drifts along in a similar laid-back modal style to some of Phil Perlman's relatively clean rivers material. So yeah, nothing earth-shattering, but an improvement nonetheless. Benson's My Father is another piano song, uh, not as Joni-influenced as the earlier She's Leaving, but no less affecting in spite. Uh, then Minkoff uh, closes the record with the eponymous piece Clearing. This one starts with a nifty free-form improv duet between cello and flute, uh, before settling into yet more pleasant pastoral folk wispiness with a, just a hint of hippie trippiness at its core. So yeah, pretty nice one overall. Uh, whilst the spiritually inclined clearing were evidently not a group prone to indulging in illicit substances, uh, they were at least uh, tuned into the counterculture enough to produce some very nice, evocative music. And yeah, thankfully they uh, avoided slipping any off-putting preachiness into their songs that you might otherwise expect from a group of this nature. Yeah, the album is a little bit too diverse for its own good in a few spots, but the high points more than make up for these inconsistencies. So yeah, another recommended one. Well, that was just a small selection of psych folk goodness from the collection. As I said, there's uh, plenty more where these came from, so if you're interested in hearing about more, then please hit subscribe to be kept up to date. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on the Acid Trash Jamboree.